Bye. Real estate agent, are you looking to acquire clients consistently so you can grow your business and your income to live a great lifestyle? This is Dave Finale and the RE Skill Builder Podcast. Hey everybody, Dave Finale here with Real Estate Talk TGIF. This is episode 127. Yep, we've done 127 episodes in 125 weeks. Have not missed a week. And uh, we are we believe in consistency. We believe in integrity. We believe in everything else. We've got a great guest today. His name is Mike McCallowitz. Some of you might know him as the author of Profit First, which is how I know him too. Um, you know, also uh, his, his latest book called Fix This Next. But Mike, I, I ask everybody the same question at the beginning of the broadcast. Do you do you know what TGIF stands for? Well, I want to say thank God it's Friday, but I assume something different. Yeah, everybody says the same thing. I think you said it the last time. Thank God it's finale right so <laughs> i love it i so, love it so here we are so mike you were on we just decided it was 85 weeks ago yeah yeah episode 40 and uh we were on a roll starting to get on a roll then less than a year and, and move forward we've got we, we talked about so many things about business about profit and you, one of the things you said that profit is not an event it's a habit yeah um you know i mean uh, your your reputation comes precedes you so Let's just get right into, you know, that line. Profit is not an event. It's a habit. Yeah. So sadly, most business owners, myself included for years, taught, taught profit or thought profit was something that happens at the end of the year or at some future point. I was trying to grow my business faster and faster and bigger and bigger, hoping that one day all of a sudden this purse of cash would you know, fall into my pocket. It never came true. What I found is that we have to build profit slowly and consistently. Every single day, every single transaction, a percentage of that money has to come out and go to profit. So when I wrote the book Profit First, what I simply said is every time you have a deposit, take a predetermined percentage of profit, hide it from your business, and run your business off the remainder. That profit will accumulate. It's, it's basically the pay yourself first principle applied to business. As I go up there, so so you, you've got a, 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 a book out that came out recently called Fix This Next. Yeah. You went from Profit First, which was, was ultimately, which is ultra successful. And you've got probably, I don't know, over 200,000 businesses that are using this now. When we, when we spoke 85 weeks ago, it was 150,000 plus. Um, and the thing is that they, one of the things you said then was because they became profitable because they became masters at it. They can be masterful at being profitable, right? Yeah, um, it's, like, it's like building a muscle. Like you, you, we actually have over 350,000 businesses now. The, oh, the wow. international uptake is massive. What's happening is the businesses that are successfully doing this don't just throw, go full throttle to the system. Like if you haven't gotten to the gym in a couple of years, like don't go back to the gym and try to bench press 300 pounds. It's going to rip your shoulders out. So let's just get stretching again. Let's start off with low weights and start building the muscle. That's what these companies are doing. The successful ones, to your point, they start slow and they let it grow. They take small percentages of profit and then the next quarter, a little bit more and the quarter after more than that, and they grow into it. Right. So so as, as I said to you, as before we came on, I, I started reading Fix This Next and I read yeah. the intro and I just like, I, I mean, everybody needs to read that intro because they're probably going to be looking themselves in the mirror as they read that about, you know, you're working your ass off, you're making money, but you're really not making money and everything else. Yeah. And, and, and what was the impetus behind behind writing that book after Profit First? I uh, I sent an email out to my readership and said, what's the biggest tr challenge you're facing in the year ahead? Now, I'm not the most technically savvy guy. I must have, like triple clicked or something because the same email went out multiple times on that same day. And some people, the same people responded to that same question, the biggest challenge for the year with different answers on the same day. Some guy from, some guy from Jersey, of course. We're both from Jersey. I had to tell her I'm making cheese this morning, by the way, just so you know. Oh, man. Oh, it's awesome. <laughs> some, some guy, he goes, in the morning, he's like, I got sales problems. In the afternoon, it was uh, hiring issues. Later on, it was vision. Then it was uh, systems. What became very clear is that the biggest problem entrepreneurs face is knowing what their biggest problem is. So that became the thesis for the book. And I developed a tool to pinpoint what your business actually needs from you now. Not all the urgent stuff, but the important thing. 
And you, you started the book with, with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and then you get yeah. into the business hierarchy of needs. Go into that a little bit. Let me know exactly where the thought process was for there to put those two together, because it's really cool. I like the way it works together. Yeah, I, I found that there's a common DNA in all business, that, that under the skin of business, it's identical. And this is true for humanity, too. If a group of people line up to each other, you can see from the outside the differences, their accent, their height, their gender, their skin color, all these different elements. But when you peel back, as vulgar as that sounds, the skin of humanity, you will see that we're the same. Like if I'm having a heart attack and I go to the doctor, she doesn't say, hey, uh, before we start the operation, where's your heart? Is it in your foot? Like, no, it's always in the same spot. The DNA makeup's the same. And therefore, the medical procedures are the same. Well, when it comes to business, I looked at businesses of all types, industry agnostic, from pizza shops, of course, in Jersey, to manufacturers, to law firms, to everything in between. And I found the common DNA exists. So when we need to do surgery, when we need to repair or improve something in our business, we always go to the same spot. Maslow, when he was diagnosing human needs, identified that foundationally all humanity has what's called physiological needs. You and I both need to breathe air, drink water, eat food. If right. that's not satisfied, nothing else matters. That's the core of our biology. But once that's adequately satisfied, then we have needs to have safety, protection from the elements uh, you know, harm uh, from others. Then once that is protected and served, we elevate to uh, belonging, to belong to a community, esteem, ultimately self-actualization. But at any time a base level needs not satisfied, we must revert to it. If I'm choking, I got to expel that thing that's lodged in my throat to breathe again. Well, in our business, we have a heart of needs too. There's just one fundamental difference. We are neurologically wired into ourselves. I know when I'm hungry. I know if I can't breathe. I know when I'm cold, but in our business, we don't know instinctually. We think we right. do, right? You know, everyone else is running Facebook ads. I should too. Maybe our instinct should be a beacon to investigate, but we need to study the hierarchy and use empirical data, information to back our assumptions. Foundationally, every business needs sales. That's the oxygen for a business. It creates cash. No cash, your business is suffocating. But only when that's adequately satisfied, do we have to worry about the next level. More sales is not necessarily a good thing. There's a certain point you can hyperventilate. You're over-breathing. We need adequate sales. We need to breathe. But then we need to absorb that oxygen to the bloodstream of the business, and that's the extraction of profit. So sales is level one. Then profit brings about stability in organization. When you have stability, you can start leveling up to order. Order is the creation of efficiency. Where there's no dependency on the owner or other employees. There's no linchpins. There's redundancy. Once that's adequately satisfied, we can elevate to impact. Impact is the creation of transformation. This is where clients who uh, are served by our business are experiencing a transformational experience. It's beyond the transaction, it's transformation. And then the highest level is called legacy. Legacy is the creation of permanence. And this is where a business is designed to live on generationally. Not, not necessarily my family buys the next generation or runs it and so forth, but it's meant to serve generations of clients because the business is that important. That's the five levels of the business hierarchy of needs. That's a great, I mean, you said legacy and people think, well, I'm going to leave my, my mark on the world and everything. But legacy is a creation of permanence is, is, is what you did. And hopefully it moves on from there. Right. Yes. Um, yeah, and then and, and this all goes along with, you know, the feeling of helping people. It all goes along with um, focusing as well. When you talk about creation of stability and creation of efficiency into the transformation, you're talking about all that rings of collaboration of working with people that are going to help you out and you can help them out. Right. How does yeah. that, how does that, the, the purpose or the focus on collaboration help business and, and help it move through when it comes to fix this next or, or profit? Yeah, first? sure. Great question. You know, there's internal collaboration and there's also external. So I'll start with the internal. Good. As, as I apply this to my own business, I realized the the bottleneck for the growth of our organization became me. I, I considered myself the superhero for the business, which is very egotistical. But I was like, oh, I can swoop in and save everything. I'm so important. But I realized the business can only move forward as quickly as I was involved in it. And I only had a certain amount of time per day. There's 24 hours. I decided to pull myself out. But the fear was if I leave the business in participating in it and I leave the responsibility to my colleagues, now I'm putting burden on them. I'm a guy going on vacation and they're paying for it. That's what I thought. But then when I started to do this, I talked to my team. They said, no, no, we're not. We don't feel like we're taking on a burden. We feel empowered. We are working now collectively. It was actually me stopping that superhero behavior that started internal collaboration. They started elevating each other. 
I was actually able to remove myself entirely from my business. And now as an owner of the business, I've reinserted myself in the way I get joy. I like to be the spokesperson, kind of like we're doing now. Right, right. So, so I do the two things I love to do. It, it brings me joy. And my team, they run the business. The beautiful thing is my business doesn't need me. If I, if I leave, we'll continue to sell to clients, generate revenue and so forth. I just got to do what brings me joy. The other part is collaboration. If we really want to scale and elevate our businesses, we need to connect with people who can expand our communities and we can expand theirs. So an active outreach to other vendors, sometimes even competitors, and seeing where we can support each other elevates each other. It's, it's that concept of as the tide rises, so do all boats. How do I lift up my collaborators, my partners in the industry, and even some of my competitors? Because I know as a result, they're going to also lift me. That's what we seek to do. I love that because collaboration is really one of the most important things. And I think it's one of the things that people miss in, in their businesses. Like we're talking about, you know, helping real estate pe people in the real estate business. Yeah. That's, that's where I'm at with, as a coach. Right. And um, the, 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 the most important thing is for them to see who can help them, not necessarily copy what others are doing, because a lot of a lot of people, you know, when you first get into business, someone's going to tell you someone inevitably is going to tell you, find out someone is doing really well and copy what they're doing. Sure. Well, here's the thing. Unless you're going to actively collaborate with them, you're not going to understand what they did and how they got there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it starts to undermine your authenticity. So it's funny. I've seen that where people say, oh, I'm just going to fake it till I make it and copy someone else. The problem is if what they're doing is not rooted into consistently with who they are naturally, there becomes this disconnect. And, and, and the consumer is very smart. They, they see that. Like, I see how you're marketing advertising. I see in person. There's a little disconnect here. They see an untruth. And now that starts compromising your ability to be of service because if people don't trust you, they don't trust you. Wow. So you got to be very careful about copying others. Here's what I do. I, I, I definitely research what other people are doing that's successful for them. And then I say, how do I envelop that in the work I'm doing? How can I be an amplification of who I am? And is there shortcuts and techniques I can learn from others? And I share my stuff actively too. Here's stuff I've learned that works for me. I encourage people to take it, but put their own spin on it. It's got to be natural and authentic. Because when people, you know, especially in real estate, when they see your online presence, they see your advertising, they meet you in person. If if that's all consistent, they're like, this is exactly the person I expected. You've instant trust. And when you've instant right. trust, you have a client that's going to do a lot of business with you. Yeah. It's, it's you know, when, when I say, when, when I talk, this is one of my favorite topics because I see it happen so often. And my objective is to help these agents, you know, see what they're doing and, and actually go deep instead of wide. And, and that's what they're trying to do is see what somebody else did and they do it all over the place and they're using the same verbiage. And, and honestly, Mike, some of the verbiage they're using is like from 30 years ago and <laughs> Right. If they're going to use it that way, I mean, there's no time machine. It's not what you do. It's how you do what you do. It's not what you say. It's how you say it's how you say what you say. And the stuff from 30 years ago will work if you say it the way you talk today. Yeah, not yeah. Like the way They talked a long time ago. It's the same thing with business, with, with business and finances. Would you agree with that? Oh, totally. We got to be careful of patchwork business where we take the best here and the best there and we make this quilt out of it. It can be kind of disheveled because it's not congruent. It doesn't make sense. You right. know, when you think about the customer journey, there's a discovery period. The, the very first time they hear you, that first impression then turns into a journey of building rapport. And maybe they don't even meet you in person. It could just be all online, but they're trying to build trust. Every time there's a disjointed message, it's incongruent, it adds confusion. Those are all points where we lose the customer. So um, it's funny. I, I call this thing ports of entry is another way to look at this. That first impression matters very much. Now, you and I both live in New Jersey. We know that New Jersey, unfortunately, has a reputation for not being the cleanest state, even though if you know New Jersey and you live here, it's like it's a beautiful state. We have things that, you know, we're the blueberry capital of the world and people don't know it. Right. The reason is we have problems with our ports of entry. The number one port of entry is New Jersey. So there's a big industrial area there. You fly in, you see in the industry, you come out of New York City, another major entry point through the Lincoln Tunnel or the Holland Tunnel, you're in these industrial areas. Or if you come through the Turnpike, you're in the industrial areas. That represents 0.1% of the state, but everyone sees that first. That's the first right. impression. So people right. are like, oh, New Jersey, sorry. New Jersey's awesome. So here's the thing that we need to know in our business. 
that first impression, if it ain't you and it's not authentic, you're in real trouble. You're showing an industrial park when you're a blueberry capital. So you got to be very careful about how that first impression plays out because that's the impression they're going to carry with them. Exactly. And, and and like you said, and I said, it's got to be consistent across all channels on what you're doing. If you see that, you're going to have a lot more, you're going to have a lot more value to them because they see what you're doing. It makes a lot of sense. So I say, I want to go in, in, into, into something you, you, you worked on and fix this next. And it's called the Omen process. Yeah. Um, could you, could you go into that and explain the, the, the four pieces of the sure. Omen process and how it works? Yes. So the first step in the fix this next process is we got to figure out what your biggest problem is. Remember that thing that the biggest problem entrepreneurs face is knowing what their biggest problem is. That business hierarchy of needs we went through, that helps you pinpoint what you need. The quick analogy is if you and I had a chain between us and we're pulling it, the chain will always break in the same spot, the weakest link. But most entrepreneurs are trying to fix everything. I'm going to fix every link, but it keeps on snapping because this chain is only as strong as the weakest link. If we know what the weakest link is, we need to strengthen that. That's the goal. So the business heart give needs pinpoints the weakest link. Then the question is, how do you make the link stronger? Use Omen. Now, Omen is four steps. Sadly, entrepreneurs usually only inherently know two and do two, and it's a big problem. They know the first one, which is objective. What's the link you want to fix? I got a sales problem. I have a profit problem. Okay, that's the objective. The M stands for the measurement. How do you know you successfully resolved it? You know, I've include, increased profit by 10%. We get three more prospects a week. That's the measurables. And most entrepreneurs know that, but most entrepreneurs leave it there. They do a set it and forget it. We need more sales. We got increased by 10%. We need more prospects. We need three more a day. And then they're like, okay, on to the next problem. They're trying to fix the next link. Well, they set a goal, but they ignore it. And they come back three months later or three years later and say, oh my gosh, we didn't achieve that. Let's set another goal. We need the two other elements. This is critical. The E in OMEN stands for evaluation frequency. How often are we going to evaluate our progress on that objective we set? This is a calendared event. This is critical, Dave. You got to put in your calendar every week, every month, whatever the appropriate frequency is to see how you're doing so you can do the next step. The next step is nurture. Nurture is giving yourself the flexibility, uh, the responsibility to adjust any objectives and measurements that you set that were incorrect. You know, when we set a goal, we set based upon our current knowledge, we may have to tweak it, but also getting people that are very close to the problem involved. I have a very small business. I have eight colleagues here that work for me. My, my eight team members, for example, we do a lot of blogging. Well, Jenna at our office is responsible for our blogs. Instead of me just saying, you know, we got to increase our readership on our blogs, Jenna, who actually does a lot of the work in that space, she's telling me, here's what the real objective should be and here's how we do it. The person closest to the problem usually has the best solution. It's the entire omen, objective, measurement, evaluation, frequency, and nurturing that's required to actually improve a weakest link and make it your strongest link. When you identify the weakest link in your business, set out to resolve it using the omen, bring it to resolution or a path to permanent resolution, the point where you know it's being fixed and then you move to the next link. Don't just start it and then jump to the next one. That's awesome. And one of the things that I, that I really, I, I really, I mean, I saw everything work down and how it all worked. And you said evaluation frequency. I think that, that I don't know if that's the most important, but it could be, you know, because a lot of things that I've learned in my business throughout the years. And one of the things I was first told when I was on my brokerage was make sure that you inspect what you expect. Right. Oh, I love that. I love that. Yes. Right. Yeah. Friday's my day. I actually uh, do this for my own personal life. Actually, I'm going to show you something personal. I have right here my own intentions for my life uh, for this year. I do it every year. I type it up and I inspect it every Friday um, along with my business objectives to measure our progress. Right outside my office here, we still meet with our COVID masks, but our team comes in. And every Friday we go over our goals. You got your, your COVID mask there too. Every uh, Friday we're looking at our goal progress. Um, and we set very specific goals. For my own, my own responsibility in our business, this quarter is to increase book sales by 100 books per day. It's very specific. And every Friday we're measuring our progress. Uh, uh, another person here, uh, Marixa, is responsible for bringing $30,000 more of monthly revenue in one of our offerings. Uh, uh, another person is bringing about what's called wearables, new, uh, new products and ideas we have. 
everyone has their specific goal and we're measuring it every Friday because it's being expected and inspected. We're making progress. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's so important to look at things like that. And so many people forget about that where, where it's like, okay, what do you got to fix? All right, it's fixed. Let's move on. And just like you said, I mean, the Omen process is, 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 is such a great way to, to put it all together. Right. Um, yeah. And, and and so so we we go back. We only have a couple minutes left. We go back to to building a business. What would you say is when it comes to finance? When it comes to money? Yeah. What is the most important thing for someone to look at when they're starting a business and just starting to get rolling with it? And they got money and they're investing money. And yeah. you know, you talked about a lot of things the last time you were on eighty five weeks ago. But you know, talk to me about that. Yeah, more sales is dangerous. So the. A lot of people think you sell your way out of things. The more sales, the better. Here's the danger in sales. The more you sell, the more responsibility you have. So the more transactions you have going on, the more clients you have to serve, the more stress and responsibility on you. So it's actually the margin of the sales that's more important. It's better to slow uh, to sell a lower frequency with a higher margin in most cases because you can extract profit and bring stability around. It brings less... Uh, overwhelmed to you because you don't have to be scrambling as much. A lot of business owners, real estate agents in particular, think I'm not making money. I need to sell more houses and more houses. And the answer is maybe not. Maybe you have to sell houses better, right? So let's slow down the, the manic call to just sell more and let's sell things that are actually profitable. That's the key. That's that, that, that's really cool. So, you know, I just, I'm putting on, on, um, uh, on the screen, MikeMcCallowis.com, but there's also another site where you that, that you talked about the last time, MikeMotorbike.com. I had that no, set. I don't know what happened to it. Well, no one can spell McCallowitz, uh, You know, the whole that is like, what the hell? So uh, everyone can remember Mike Motorbike. It still exists. It actually forwards you to my website. So if you go to Mike, yeah. um, my books, all those books you see there. Uh, I used to write for the Wall Street Journal, um, and I actually have my own podcast called Mike Up in Your Business. It's all available for free at MikeMotorbike.com. MikeMotorbike.com. Mike, any parting things you want to tell people aside from you just told them how to, how to get there? What's the what's the last parting thing you want to, you want to give everybody right now? Okay, you you the one listening in right now, wherever you are in cyber world, you have a responsibility to be successful. This COVID crisis uh, is probably the most significant economic shift we've ever experienced since right. the Great Depression. And it's a weird event because we see a collapse of Main Street with an incline in Wall Street, right? The stock market's taking off as Main Street collapses. That is a very dangerous situation, which means there is a tsunami wave of change coming. But here's the great news. Out of every economic shift, the businesses that pull us out of it are small businesses. You, me, us. Small business will rise in this occasion and turn the economy. And I don't know the names of those businesses today, but in five years, we will all know those names. So my question is, why don't you choose you? Why don't you be the one who turns this economy and start with you? You have a responsibility to be successful. Mike, thank you so much. And I know last time we got cut off at the end because I went through that. And 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 the reason you came back on finally was- well, I want the hat. Right, been- exactly, right? So you wanted your hat, right? Everybody gets a hat. I actually autograph them. So how cool is that? I right. love that. I've been so, waiting for that. And I, uh, now you got my address. So uh, I look forward to throwing that cap on. I'll be sending that to you soon. Mike, thanks again for coming on. Thanks, uh, you're busy. You're gonna, it's really cool. If you can stay on for a second, please do. Um, we're going to see you and uh, everybody. I hope this was good for everybody here. And we'll see you, we'll see you again next week with Tina Call at 11 a.m. on Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, Black Friday. Well, I actually started last week. But anyway, here we go.